son, and it's good to be back. And I understand that we are going to page 21, so... Um, Joe, give us a quick show the hold on what Matt did uh, to the class. My you son mind? teaches at the University of Edinburgh in the New Testament, and he was lecturing uh, here at uh, Loyola and Notre Dame, University of Chicago, and Wheaton. And, um, what a combination. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Um, so he was tired uh, after that. And uh, we met in Chicago. And uh, I was telling James coming down, my bride and my son are, he's our, our firstborn, and he's the most like Barb out of all of us. Um, it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. <laughs> so when they're together, uh, it, it's just, there's this amazing relationship between the two of them. So after a little while, I just kind of stabbed back <laughs> and uh, let her and her firstborn be together. But it was a very good time, and we talked a lot about the book he's working on now and the one that's coming next, which just makes my head hurt. Um, but it's just... What are the titles? Well, he's finishing one now on Paul and the Law, and then he'll be working on a commentary on Philippians for the Oxford University Press series, which I just can't even... So great. You know, I really do feel like that scene from Elf. I know him. I know him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, just amazing. So uh, it's a real blessing to, to see the impact that the Gospels have in his heart. But it's good to be back. And I missed it. I really did. I, uh, I wish I could have been here for the discussion. Um, we are starting in chapter 19. Is that right, Gil? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What I'm, I, I may actually do is reach back to uh, 17 and, and then and go up a little bit. Are there any announcements? Did anybody but me notice that John's email said we're going to page 221? Yeah, I did. Oh. <laughs> I did, and it made me a li little nervous because I said, I think that's not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, my bad. <laughs> but, but, this is in the book. Yeah, we, we've been moving yeah. this for the last four or five days. By the way, the, the money you guys helped raise for Kenny and his truck, we got his truck fixed. He's been helping me for several days. Kenny from over at West Side. So that's worked out real well. So I appreciate he he appreciates everybody's help. And uh, appreciate your prayers. Got an announcement of three or four days ago from California the Master of Boxing wants me to come out to Boston and do an exhibition night. Uh, April the twenty fourth and then be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Oh, no. wow. oh, oh. oh. So I know him. I know him. <laughs> and I didn't give him that black eye. He was the other day and got it. So I'm back in the rain, he got a black eye the first time. <laughs> so that's, hopefully I can give all the praise and glory to Amen. Right? That's wonderful. Golly. Do not tick him off, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that when funny. I needed heavy things moved, guess who I asked? <laughs> <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to see you. Let's let's begin with prayer. If there's no other announcement, let's pray. So much. So much about you remains at a distance. So much within us desires more. And so much within us resists the pursuit of more. Would you make this a time when the resistance is defeated? And we become supple in your hands. And you will break fresh ground and sink your plowshare deep, pull up soft loam. 
Please, Lord. So work within us. And we're asking that you would teach us as we are helped by an older brother and brothers whose works he's compiled. We invite this grace and need it and therefore tell you and now depend upon you for its provision. For we're asking in Christ's name. Amen. Before I um, go to the section on the monastic life on 17 and just touch on it, I want to make a suggestion um, for when you are reading at different moments in church history. And I want to give you an example. Um, some of the things that, that I, I've been reading have made me want to tweak them just a little bit. I don't know if you felt that. Well, that's overstated, or that's a little much. Um, and I want to just offer an, a way of thinking. When I see someone do that, like he said a great deal about distancing from uh, created things in the world. And so I, when I do that, I try to say, all right, what are the ways that people look at the world now, then? And I wrote these down. Um, I came up with one, two, three, four, five of them. All the way to the right, and I'm not saying that because of it being conservative, all the way to the right would be creation is God. And that, that really is the position of some people. If, if it's created, that's where God is. And there's an identification between God and creation. That's one. Then, there's creation is good. It's not God, but it's always good. It's never dangerous. It's always good. An example of that, I can't think of his name, was the gentleman who went out to live with the grizzly bears and they tore him to shreds. Um, but wanted to look at creation as always good instead of written in tooth and claw, but found out he was wrong, sadly. Um, so creation is God, therefore not dangerous. Creation is good, therefore not dangerous. The third, in the middle, more, is creation is good but fallen. Made good, and much of the elements of its goodness are still there. I was just at the Chicago Institute of Art. Man, was that an exercise in creation being good. To see what the Impressionists can create, and to stand in front of a Van Gogh, and a Cezanne, and just, it was wonderful. So in that position, creation's good, but fallen, sometimes it's dangerous. Sometimes. Not always, sometimes. And then to the left of that, creation is not good. It's mainly dangerous. And this is a bit of nuance. And finally, all the way to the left, creation is evil. It's perpetually personally evil now almost postured against you sometimes as I've read him he's lingered in the left too as it's either evil or mainly dangerous but the middle one the creation is good but fallen sometimes dangerous sometimes not I think is a more uh, biblical approach. The reason I'm, I'm modeling this is sometimes in Christian living we only read books with which we agree. And that's not a good thing. Uh, every this is, Gordon MacDonald said this, every movement in church history has been caused to change by its, from its periphery. By its periphery. Someone who was on the margins said, now wait a minute, wait a minute, and called people back to biblical center. 
So when I read that line, I thought, you know, it's helpful if I learn from people who think I'm a nut or I'm really wrong to hear what do they see that I don't see or I'm not seeing well. And that's why I wanted to start with a monastic life. But does what I'm saying make sense to you? I, I want to remind you when we were reading the Puritans, I, I said repeatedly, remember if you were a Puritan, the only people you could quote was a Catholic. That's a very profound statement. And when you listen to sometimes the tension between Protestants and Catholics, we forget that. But think about this. Look at the section on monastic life. I, I wasn't here for your discussion, so I mean you no disrespect by wanting to just point this out. <clears throat> First paragraph. If you wish peace and concord with others, you must learn to break your will in many things. This is page 13. To live in monasteries or religious communities, to remain there without complaint and to persevere faithfully till death is no small matter. Blessed indeed is he who there lives a good life and there ends his days in happiness. Listen, um, sustained relationship with people that are hard to live with is a great thing. <laughs> Joy laughed because she's married. <laughs> you learn this. You do. You learn this in marriage. You learn this. So I can go home and tell my wife that I'm a great thing. <laughs> it is a good thing to have your will bashed by living with people who disagree with you and they never go away. <laughs> and you wish they'd go away, but they never go away. Because you're always you facing an immovable force other than God or yourself. Yeah. But, you know, we disagree with God. Yes. Uh, exactly why it's important. Yeah, because he says, my ways are not your ways. Exactly. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So, yeah. And that's exactly why it is so important to not value um, superficial unity and undervalue profound disunity. Undervalue yeah. disunity. I just spent ten and a half hours. Say that again. <laughs> say that again. Say it slowly. <laughs> I just spent ten and a half hours in a car with my wife to Chicago and ten and a half back. We disagreed a lot. <laughs> and I couldn't get out of the car. Well, that's just great for you. Exactly. And that was just going through my mind as I was reflecting. And as Protestants, many of you, like me, will look at the monastic life and go, no good there. That's a lie. You take a single person... And you put them in an atmosphere where they can't get out because they've taken vows. And it's not easy to be there for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. What a great thing for an unmarried man. What a great thing for an unmarried woman. But pushing it, a lot of the blessing of that first point is lost on us because we don't stay anywhere. Least of all in churches. Ooh. One little thing you don't like? Ooh. I'm out of here. Listen, one of the greatest trespasses and sins of Protestants is we got one foot in, but we always got one foot out. You tick me off? I'm out of here. That's our way. And that ain't good. And the monastic life, marriage, Real fellowship says, I'm in. You're not like me, I'm not like you, but I'm in. And I want to walk with you, and I want to learn from you, even when we disagree. And I just, I didn't want, if you're a Protestant, I didn't want you to just go through that chapter and go, nothing here for me. Oh, yeah, there is. Joe, can I make a comment? Yeah. So I was very uncomfortable reading that, as you can 
imagine. But I kept thinking that I understand it for a season, but I don't understand it for a godly way of life to completely say I'm sanctioning myself off from what you were saying, where you know the creation is essentially evil. That's the message that was kept bothering me reading this, that I, I kept thinking, I mean, I can't help but think the creation is good but broken, but not something that I, I would so despise, sort of the way it was being presented. That's why, through it, so. I, I, that's why I began with that first, but also yeah. why you will see that in the history of monasticism, there were different orders mm -hmm. in order to engage because the image of God is inside of us. You can't get rid of it. And <laughs> we worship a God, <clears throat> like it's no small thing that when Mary, I'm not going to push this too far, but when Mary saw Jesus after the resurrection, remember who she mistakenly thought he was? She was right. <laughs> He was the gardener. Wow. He made Eden. <laughs> you worship a God who's a gardener. He, I want to tell you, if you if you read the different creation accounts, if you read the Babylonian, the Akkadian, if you read the Egyptian, nobody says creation is good but the Bible. And incidentally, no women are in the creation account either. None. None, let alone be called image of God. And nowhere is rest ever mentioned. But my, my point is, that's inside of us. We know, though we may not know it here, we may be in a monastery and think creation's evil, but we know, because we're in the image of a God who made it good, it's good. So we're drawn to it. And we want to reconnect. So you find, as you watch the history of monasticism, you find people like the Jesuits who said, man, we, we got to engage with this world. And so we're going to start moving near the universities and, and arguing the case of Christianity. Aren't most of those monasteries in really pretty places? Not all of them. No, no. no. Things like the one I've seen here, you know. No, not all. Because you're thinking more of the ones that would isolate, which you're objecting to. And um, so that, that's, I think that's a right reservation. So, yeah. I just, I'm sitting here thinking about the fact that as a culture, we've kind of, we're moving in the direction of a monastic kind of like, it, we don't interact with people anymore. Like we, we call up, you know, the grocery store, they pack our groceries up, we pull up, we pick them up. We don't, you, go to, you don't have to order at a counter anymore at Panera or McDonald's or a lot of places. So people aren't talking to each other. So what's happening to the culture is the culture is withdrawing. And so for us as people to be those who engage, to be those who take that extra step, that not that we're going to necessarily move and live next to a school so we can engage, but that mentality that we as believers are the ones that say, I'm not going to live this, like, and I'm taking it to more of like a cultural thing because I know this is the spiritual side of it, but I think it's affected us as a people that we pull into our garages, we shut our doors, we don't talk to our neighbors, we sit in our backyards, we never see anybody else, so we've created these little protective barriers, and the world isn't impacted by our faith because we're all kind of like monastically living anyway. So I just had that thought that that's... I think that's, that's very helpful. My friend Chanda would say always remove as many pieces of creation from between you and other people as possible. <clears throat> only, only put pieces of creation in between you and another human when necessary. So in other words, you know, I should only email if I can't talk with John. Or I should only call because I can't be with him. And Chanda said, keep moving them away because you were designed to be this way. So don't keep adding pieces of creation, but removing them. So that the very thing that you're talking about. Dick, you want to say something? Yeah, I want to, I want to say that I think a problem that maybe Protestants have with monasticism goes a little bit deeper in that, for example, celibacy. What do you all think of celibacy? 
I mean, Catholics, we in our tradition, we believe that there are calls or vocations like to the priesthood. That's a celibate life. And I studied for five and a half years there till God made it clear, no, celibacy is not for you. But, and I say that to say that I think you need to try to get around what Joe is saying. Look a little beyond what you're familiar with and think of it as a vocation and as a call to a type of life which is what I think monasticism really was. It wasn't, I don't, you know, Joe, I, I beg to disagree a little bit. I don't think it was a put down of some things as much as it was, I'm being called to a little different drummer where I can hear and write and write for others, write for myself, contemplate, meditate, and then different orders came about where some wanted to go into the academics the Jesuits, other, the poor, other different. That was sort of, that's a little bit beyond the monasticism, and it's really more of a, of a call that still exists today, by the way. We still have those very same orders, the Capuchins, Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits, that have a, a particular call to a particular group of people. So I'd just say, keep an open mind, and, and that maybe, indeed, some people, some women are called to the convent to serve. Fewer and fewer, uh, and fewer and fewer priests, at least in the U.S., being called to a celibate life. So I, I throw that out just for your, by way of background. I was, I, that's helpful, Dick. I, I've been helped just because of my own choices. I, I grew up in a home where my father uh, had um, Playboy magazines sent to the house, so it sat in the magazine rack with Life and Look magazines. The damage that did to me is off the charts. It's just, it's not even measurable. I don't, there's not a Richter scale that I can adequately measure the damage that did. So there are things I cannot do. Like when I've been asked to speak at a college conference at the beach in the summer, I cannot go to the beach until after sundown. I can't do it. Um, I was a lifeguard before I was converted and fought tooth and nail after I became converted. I've had to make choices to isolate that I can't because I cannot. Now I can't dictate that. Like We had General Assembly one year in Fort Lauderdale, Florida um, and I went because I supposed to go. I'm a BCA elder. I got at the hotel and I checked in. I'm looking at the lady and the way she's dressed. I went right to the phone. I called Barb and said, I'm coming home. I got to get out of this place. I got to get out now. And so I said, excuse me, I'm checking out. <laughs> I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't stay. Um, the, the reason I'm telling you that, remember, we read the rule of Benedict. That Benedict went into a cave because Rome had become so corrupt that he couldn't live in downtown Roman cities anymore and not sin. So he said, I'm out of here. I can't do it. Maybe you guys can, but I can't do it. So he pulled out. And other people said, ah. Uh. In fact, the very word monastic means alone. Men hermit, mona, one. And so we went to mona. And the other people said, can we make a dua? <laughs> uh, we ain't doing so good downtown anymore. Um, can we come live with you? Because they're making decisions. I'm called to live holy. And I can't do it there anymore. So I'm coming to move in. And he went, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> and so that's where I love that rule. If you remember, it had that quote that when they would, um, when one would sin against another, the one who had trespassed would lay face down in front of his brother until the other person forgave him. You might be on the floor for a long time, you know? <laughs> but you just didn't get up until the other guy said, all right. What a great practice to do in marriage. <laughs> I'm just going to lay down here, dear, until you forgive me. <laughs> We're just going to shut down family until there's some reconciliation here. Um, a 
just I'm trying to say with what Dick was saying, I, I'm called to holiness. There's things I cannot go, things I cannot do. I, I can't. My son, the last thing I'll say, my son um, has a flip phone. <laughs> and it broke yesterday. It was so fun to go to Verizon because he said, I can't get a smartphone. So I, I got to get a, a flip phone. <laughs> when you say to somebody at a Verizon store, can I please have a flip phone? They're, they look at you like uh, you are a dinosaur. Um, they actually had one. <laughs> they had one. And so he's got his new flip phone. I said to him, I'm so proud of you. I am so proud of you. You don't have porn in your pocket. That is great, man. Uh, just, just keep going. And he said, I don't think they're going to be able to do this the next 10 years when this thing dies. Mm. But anyway, you were going to say something. Um, I just really value this conversation, Dick, your statements. Um, but we so um, tend to use the word legalism. Um, because we have judged someone's motive. And Joe, you might have been, if we hadn't attached your name to Joe Novenson and you said, well, I do a flip phone and I don't go to the beach, we would have said, there's a legalist. You know, in most of our churches, that's what you would have been branded. And But then, you know, you have a reputation, so we know that Joe is not a legalist. But we do that with... Um, whether you wear short skirts or long skirts, whether, I mean, there's still that kind of tr trivial stuff of how we judge. Um, but a story that I was thinking of, um, I don't know if anybody in here knows Roger Lambert, um, but he was doing a session on church history, and he talked about a monastic figure, and I can't remember his name, who built out in the desert a Simon Stylites and I'm going how did he preach the gospel effectively out in the desert on a platform but Roger um, further connected the fallout from that movement in church history and how God used it and I go I'm guilty again <laughs> quickly judging and you know, um, setting something aside is not and not important that God can use. But, but I was just thinking too on a very personal, individual basis. Um, that has been really important in my life. And and to say that Joe's openness about pornography um, has helped our family move from shame. <clears throat> which gets you stuck in your private sins. Um, it moved us from shame to confession um, because you so transparently have spoken through the years about um, well, it, those things. The only reason is it's good to... Yeah. Cockroaches hate light. <laughs> and so it's always good to drag them into the light and watch them scurry because then you can get them. The generic thing I was thinking of is that from anybody's perspective, there's a valid reason for why they think the way they do. And to try to figure out what is that person's perspective. Because, as we say, we're, we're missing a bunch of stuff because we're thinking, well, that's not the way I think. But to, to try to understand the other person's perspective, <clears throat> to me, is the generic kind of thing. And that, uh, that's very much behind God stooping to become human in the incarnation. There would be Christians that would denigrate that and say, no, just present the truth. <clears throat> then why incarnate? Why not just present the truth? Why become one of those who are redeeming? Is it only to die for them? Or is it not also to live for them? And um, it's 
So that, that's a... You're also a missionary. You would jerk any missionary out of a field in a minute for not learning the culture to which they have gone and appreciating it. However, we will marry and I will land on the island of Barb and I will not esteem Barbism because it's different than Joeism. And I try to think missiologically when she speaks and I don't understand it so that I can say, all right, different culture. And I don't agree, but help me understand it. And um, it's taken 44 years, but we've gotten better at it. We were facing a really hard thing for me in the car coming back. And her questions that weren't assaultive, but were pushing, were really helpful. And um, really helpful. So it's a very important point. But, uh, but it's also... If you go to denominations and different quadrants of the kingdom to learn to esteem, <clears throat> even if you do not agree. But James has been waiting to say something. Well, I just want to make a connection, you know, taking from the general what you're talking about, how, how something that, that this man has learned from monastic life, um, I think to Dick's point, that there's real value, some categories he's bringing up, that can answer some of our issues, as maybe uh, maybe fundamentalism is a you know is a kind of withdrawing from the world. Creation is bad. Something that he does that really helps me distinguish in terms of category is he doesn't say that temptation is removing yourself from temptation is the same thing as removing yourself from sin, which I think is one of the false steps of fundamentalism. You know. And we all know that now, probably, hopefully, decades on, that removing yourself from temptation isn't the same thing as removing yourself from sin. And the way he proves that is that he talks about the removal from the world being actually, you know, I heard over Dick talking about Lent beginning today. The removal from the world is actually a way to go deeper, a call to the Lord, to go deeper into an experience of your sin, your sinfulness, so that the Lord can reveal and work on that. I mean, he's describing that in different places where his isolation from the world is so he can feel the real sorrow of his sin and repent and, you know, the, the mercy and grace of God there. And so I think, I don't know, that was just helpful for me in terms of, you know, temptation and sin. And also I think this bigger conversation about what can we learn from a monastic 500 years ago. Um, he's, he's pursuing something that we're all pursuing, but he may have found a way that we need to go. You know, we actually may need to go away from the world some and its distractions and its kind of happy pleasures to actually feel the sorrow of our sin. That's what impressed me about the monastic life, as I read, is that he's willing to he's willing to deal with the sorrow of sin. And then in addition to this particular perspective of it, um, I lived in the <clears throat> Kitty Bess, that was the Gilbert Islands when I got there, and they got independence from Britain. Uh, middle of the Central Pacific, just beyond the International Date Line, crosses the equator. They had oh, had oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. last week. <laughs> uh, in other words, the farthest you can get from land ma mass, hmm. anywhere you can find. Um, Congregationalists, Protestants, both English and American, in the 1830s and shortly after after they explored the Pacific started to send missionaries there and then French Catholics did and when I was there I still remember this British Baptist commenting you know I think when revival comes here it's going to come through the Catholics and then I was fascinated somebody evidently was from publicity from a year ago showed uh, Franklin Graham and his son-in-law on this side of islands where I had been, the son-in-law's father had helped liberate from, from the Japanese World War II. And there was at least one provable miracle through the Catholic Church there. 
And uh, it was absolutely fascinating to me to see a different kind. Uh, and also when Franklin Graham was there with the shoeboxes, it was the first time both had worked together. So that was a very, very positive thing. But to see a different kind of relationship and see godly missionary women, as well as, didn't know the men well, of course, but. How many places have you lived, Virginia? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I've had 35 apartment mates, but I've lived in Asia, Africa, Western and Eastern Europe, and the Pacific. Okay. <laughs> and I'm here. Yeah, we're glad you're here. And as my sister said after her first visit, she said, there's a Bible verse that I think applies to you. And I said, what's that? And she said, the, the lines are drawn for me in pleasant places. <laughs> Joe, I'm going to awesome. make a comment about the Catholics, the uh, example. <clears throat> While you are gone last week, <clears throat> I covered briefly with the commenting on Acts 2, 25 and 36, talking about the Simeon and Anna's <laughs> stories of that chapter paragraph. But uh, <clears throat> if you think about that fellow, the Simon, I think Stalin is the name, he lived on the top of the column for 40 years, isolated. But nobody talks about his dependency mutual dependency, other people's grace. 40 years you have to be fed. You cannot live without eating any. You have to urinate, you have to defecate. 40 years, you cannot have no bowel movements. Impossible. <laughs> so, he we all think like that, Gil, you just no, said. No, no, no. Seriously, you have to be supplied with the water, food, elimination has to be removed living on top of the column for 40 years, he totally forgets he depends on other people's mercy to provide for those. He's not isolated. Physically, he's separated up there, but he utterly depends on other people's grace, more depend on others than when he's in the middle of society. And that's the flaw of that logic. What we read that part in the previous books in the details here about him, example, nobody talks about his utter dependency on the other people's grace and care while he's enjoying physical isolation of them. That's the flaw of that thought process. That never occurred to me. I just, <clears throat> thank you. I, we talk about it. I, I know, I know. That's just, yeah. I, that really, that's actually very helpful. Um, Brother Hickelmotham, you're going to say something? No, 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 no. Okay, I, I was just going to, um, I wanted to pick up on something James was saying and connecting to Dick. It, <clears throat> when you said that removal from uh, the object of temptation doesn't separate you from sin. That's right. If you have, you always take your sin with you. <clears throat> oh boy. If you have never spent um, a time in isolation or in a monastery, um, it will do you a really, you'll understand how it will make you face yourself. Go to a cloistered monastery. There's one in Calhoun, Georgia. Your first day, you will climb the walls. The dead silence will be absolutely, in this world of noise, it will just about overwhelm you. And your feeling, thinking of your own sin will just about be audible. The second day, it starts to become livable. But the facing of it is more vivid, more... It's some of the hardest stuff to be utterly quiet and face yourself for 24, 48, 72 hours. It will rock your world to do that as a lifestyle holy cavoli the amount of work that would take spiritually like if you think that's escape you've never done it <laughs> if you can go a week like that it is hard work 
it makes perfect sense to me that morning vespers would start till like 3 a.m. said, oh, get me to the Bible quickly. Somebody's singing. Um, just to get something inside of me different than this because it's so haunting. Has there been studies of prisoners put in isolation and what it's done to them? Oh, yeah. In terms of facing... Yeah. It has. I've never, I've never I've heard much about that. Quite a bit. I, I would... Um, I can't call anything, but yes. But I want to ask you to look at the bottom of um, page 15. That he's used this phrase repeatedly. The fact that just uh, the practices of good religious. I love that. Let's start at the top of that chapter, in the 19th chapter. The life of a good religious. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? <laughs> Ought to abound in every virtue so that he is interiorly what to others he appears to be. And the good reason there ought to be much more within than appears on the outside. For he who sees within is God, whom we ought to reverence most highly wherever we are, and in whose sight we ought to walk pure as the angels. What a wonderful point on integration the connecting who you are on the outside with who you are on the inside. A great deal, I think, of spiritual maturation is, is that. That what we really are outside and inside connects. The second paragraph, each day we ought to renew our resolutions and arouse ourselves to fervor as though it were the first day of our religious life. We ought to say, help me, O Lord, in my good resolution and in your holy service, grant me now this very day to begin perfectly, for thus far I have done nothing. Sound familiar? Remember Dr. K? Good morning, Holy Spirit. <laughs> this is your day. I am your servant. Show me your way. What a great way to begin the day. And then down to the fourth paragraph. Just men depend on the grace of God rather than their own wisdom in keeping the resolutions. And then I, I don't know if, the, if he's the first one who wrote this. In him they confide every undertaking, for man indeed proposes, but God disposes. Have you ever heard that phrase, man oh, proposes, yeah. God disposes? I've always wondered, who said that? I wondered, this is pretty old. <laughs> I wondered, is this the first place it showed up? Um, I don't know. And then he uses this phrase, the last paragraph, if you cannot recollect yourself continuously, do so once a day at least, in the morning or in the evening. What, what a great phrase. Don't you, when you go through a day, don't you just feel scattered? <laughs> okay, I'm going to collect all the junk and say, what does all this mean? What am I going to do with all of this? What a great phrase. I need to recollect and say, what, what do I do with this part of my life now, Lord? Or when I wake up after dreams, yeah. oh, what do I do with all that? I don't, to, I don't know what to do with all that stuff. Um, it just, that's a great, a great phrase. One more, and then Johnny, I'll, then you can. Um, yeah, go over to uh, page. 17. First, second full paragraph. No man appears in safety before the public eye unless he first relishes obscurity. Mm. No man is safe in speaking unless he loves to be silent. Mm. No man rules safely unless he's willing to be ruled. No man commands safely <coughs> unless he's learned well how to obey. No man rejoices safely unless he has within him the testimony of a good conscience. Mm. That's a needle point right there. <laughs> you know, put that over your mantle piece. Wow. That, um, shut my mouth until I'm really able and called to speak. Johnny, what were you going to say? <clears throat> After reading uh, Union with Christ, was the Union with God. What's, what's the name of the book that we were reading in a small group? Yeah. Union with Christ? Yeah. And then reading this. Okay. It's, you know, it's, it's like I'm never without 
Christ. He's always kind of right there, you know, checking my thoughts. Uh, uh, I guess with a crook in my life. <laughs> Even with that crook. Yeah, with a crook in my lot. Uh, it's, it's a safe place. You uh, make me think of... Did you notice that that sentence you just... Paragraph you just read has safety in there four times? No, I didn't. That's great. No man appears in safety before the public eye unless he first relishes obscurity. No man is safe in speaking unless he loves to be silent. Yeah. No man rules safely unless he's willing to be ruled. No man commands commands safely unless he has learned how to obey. No man rejoices safely until he has within him the testimony of a good conscience. Mm -hmm. Is that for safety? Yeah. It's amazing. Read it and didn't even, it hadn't even read it. The thing I was saying about if you if you think the monastic life is escape, you've not tried it. Um, go down to the bottom of 17, second paragraph up. <clears throat> Your cell will become dear to you if you remain in it, but if you do not, it will become wearisome. If in the beginning of your religious life you live within your cell and keep to it, it will soon become a special friend and a very great comfort. Go to the third paragraph up top. If you desire true sorrow of heart, seek the privacy of your cell and shut out the uproar of the world as it is written in your chamber to well your sins. There you will find what too often you lose abroad. Boy, to be alone with yourself. Man, it is, it is one hard piece of work. You know, the other thing, Joe, growing up as an only child, you you develop an imagination that can take you when I was a kid I could just look at the clouds and just be in awe. And and I find myself back in that place now. That's interesting you say that. Uh, C. S. Lewis reflects on that as an only child. And he wrote as a boy a, a little myth called Boxen and talked about living alone as a single child, an only child, and developing the capacity for imagination, which then comes out in all of his works so well, of God's writing our story and intending those things for our good. And then having parents that are, uh, my dad was the man to be 116, 117 years old. So the conversations that they had as Christians with with these older men talking about the Bible and having a blast, just laughing, and uh, it was just amazing to me to just sit around them old folks and just listen and imagine what they what their lives were like. Amen. I utterly agree. I still believe nursing facilities and assisted living yeah. facilities are one of the greatest resources for the kingdom, mm. and nobody goes there anymore. Mm. It's where we warehouse the people we don't want to be with instead of treasure the wisdom that we ought to listen to. Um, well, I just want to comment. You're encouraging me for the person that moved in recently. We're meeting Saturday mornings from 9 to 9.30, memorizing, uh, 9.30 to 10, and memorizing scripture. Sweet. Oh my, what a difference. For instance, we both knew the 23rd Psalm. We read it several times together, and then we talk about different parts. The Lord is my shepherd, or just my shepherd. What does he make it? What does E-T-H -H mean? It continues. He's not just making me lie down in green pastures. And then what greener pastures are for sheep. He leadeth me beside the still waters because she won't, won't drink from running water. And 
and they would not lie down in green pastures if they were afraid mm -hmm. and there was any threat. He restoreth my soul, that continuation kind of thing. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you mean he's going to accomplish something while we're here? Um, and then the last verse, surely, that's definite, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I dwell, will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I had not, I mean, I knew the facts, but I'd never seen it in this verse before. All the days of my life, and then forever. And so there's the now, and there's the future. Well, the difference, I mean, we talked about certain things the first week and other things, but he leadeth me, and he restoreth my soul, is when it came alive. Why don't just want to pray? <laughs> Thank you. Makes, makes all the difference when you're in the room. Thank you. That is a wonderful embodiment and teaching to us. Thank you. Joe, can I ask a quick question? Because where we're at right now, I had been praying about this on the way here, and I know we only have like five minutes, but my pastor preached this last Sunday about the fact that true satisfaction is found in Christ alone. And I kind of just wanted to ask this group of wise, seasoned believers, like, what does that actually mean? Because even what we're talking about, the idea that the monastic, like what you pointed out, this man sitting on top of a pole seeking God in his monastic state, but yet the reality is being isolated like that doesn't necessitate that we're going to deal with ourselves or with our sin. If we go into that place hoping to, wanting to, we will. But you can isolate yourself and be in silence and quiet and never deal with yourself. And so I've just been thinking about when it says that true satisfaction is found in Christ alone, what does that, how, 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 like, what, so I thought I'd ask that because we're at this place where I was like, it isn't necessarily about isolating yourself, but what is the, and I know it's not something we can answer in five minutes, but I just thought I'd ask this. It's just a small question. I, I, haven't, I haven't thought about much else since yeah. Sunday because I thought, yeah, what is the... What, what would you say? Go ahead, Dan. <clears throat> I've said in here before <clears throat> that I think something that we really lack is we do not spend enough time, if any, in contemplation and meditation. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying is so true that in our hecticness, if you will, that we don't just stop, turn off the radio, turn everything off, and be quiet. Yeah. No intercession, just be quiet before the Lord. I think that's what we're really missing. And I think, oh, there's going to be all kinds of baseball players, football, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff come in. But you, you try to weed through that and sort of try to get back to what's important in life. You know, let's, let's sort of... It takes some time, and I think we're really, truly missing that in the ear pot. You know, it's just, I think it's, uh, everything is yelling, you need noise. you got to have music. you got to have this. you got to have that. you got to be multitasking, sending messages, texting, you know, listening to music. And, and we just really need to sit back, be quiet. And then I think we will, each one of us. Be still and know that I am God. Amen, Gary. Amen. <laughs> yes. It's, it's written here. I mean, in the same way you're in the love of solitude and silence, the Bible, page 17. In silence and quiet, the devout soul advances in virtue and learns the holy truths of scriptures. You find it in scripture. Yeah. She, I thought that was interesting, she finds a flood of tears with them which debate and cleanse herself finally. That she might become more intimate with her Creator. The farther she withdraws from all the tumult of the world, for God and His holy angels will draw near to Him and draw withdrawals to <coughs> friends and acquaintances. Basically, the withdrawals to be still before the Lord. To me, when you that question, for, for my life, knowing that through the process of knowing that God created this universe, he created this earth, he created us humans, he is sovereign. I don't like a lot of things that happen, but he is sovereign, he is good, he, lo he, he loves me, even though it doesn't appear that way sometimes. 
that knowing him, knowing him intimately yeah. and coming to him with everything that about my life and only wanting to serve him that's it doesn't matter the circumstances and the issues that I don't like I give it back to him and I find a peace and the only way I can find the peace is because of him and because I've come to that point that that's truth and it's only him you know so the, the, the thing you're saying that you can only find that in Christ Jesus is just true because he's he's all totally huh all in all yeah and he's totally in control I I'd like to ask him about a few of the things that I have <laughs> wasn't there a better you know uh, in fact well, I here promise one. you, you won't say that in heaven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to say, wasn't there a better way to do that? You won't say that. Yeah. I, remember, I, I remember I said it once here a long time ago. I said, I don't mind, you know, God's so What I worry about is how much pain the best, best path he has for me is going to entail. You know? All things work together for yeah. good and all that. I said, I, I'm there. I just worry about the pain that is going to be in that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, But he knows that, and he's already been through it. Yeah, that's right. Which is a lot worse than and yet what we're going to do. But the bottom of 19 <laughs> is this. Also, wherever you go, wherever you are, wherever you go, you are miserable unless you turn to God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's that? Uh, the bottom of 19, the last three lines, wherever you are, wherever you go, you are miserable unless you turn to God. Amen. 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 What a good place to end. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to Jenny's question when you return. Um, so hey, Joe, I'll come back to where I started. I kind of got us down the rabbit trail. And just say that the idea of calling is pertinent and wise. And then the idea of for a season makes sense. The struggle of saying this is the only lifestyle of a perfect person was troubling me. So there is that notion that we need times, everyone needs times, not just those who have a calling. And some are called for a truly a lifestyle like that. But it's not a prescription for everyone and all. It makes me feel better. Um, or at least rebellious and happy with it or something. <laughs> <laughs> I can deal with it better that way. That's helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Shall we go, since we went to 21, shall we go to the top of 25? All right, see if we can make it. Page 25? Yeah, top of page 25. I love that I can miss two weeks and like you've moved like three pages. Page twenty five or chapter twenty five? Yes. Top yes, of what? top of page. They're on the same they're page. The same page. <laughs> yes, they're on. Yes. Top of page twenty five. So you go through twenty four, chapter twenty four. Let's pray. Grant us rest. And let us work in this world out of the rest you grant. And thank you for the promise that there is yet a rest ahead, the likes of which we can only imagine. It will be so good not to sin anymore. Come Holy Spirit and enable us to be faithful this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.